Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this event co-organized by the permanent missions of Cambodia and of China to ASCAP and the Center for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization, ASCAP CSAM, on promoting food security by combating soil degradation in the Asia and the Pacific. Uh, my name is Yutong Li and I'm the head of ASCAP CSAM. Uh, I will moderate our discussions today. As we will begin the session shortly, please ensure your microphone is muted. Can you note that the event will be recorded for further dissemination? Uh, we have collected in our registration form a number of questions from participants for our panel. If you have uh, further questions, you may type them using the chat function. Uh, should we not be able to share the questions with the panel due to the time constraints and in order not to overlap with the APFSD program, we will follow with you individually after the event. So, so without any further ado, we will now begin the event and it's my great honor to introduce our first distinguished speaker, Ms. Amida. Sasia Alicia Habana, United Nations Under Secretary uh, General and Executive Secretary of ASCAP. Thank you very much, Jutong. Excellency Ambassador Oak Sornborn of Cambodia, Excellency Ambassador Xi Xiang Han of China, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to join this event co-organized by the permanent missions of Cambodia and China to ESCAP to discuss a very timely topic on promoting food security through combating soil degradation. Food security is one of the key issues that the pandemic has aggravated in the past two years through the disruption of food production, distribution and supply chain and an increasing socioeconomic impact of marginalization of the workforce involved in our food system. Despite the brief decrease in mid-2021, food prices have been rising again since early 2022, uh, reaching an all-time record high last month. In 2022, the High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development and the Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development are conducting an in-depth review of five sustainable development goals, including goal 15. Goal 15 is life on land, which emphasizes the fight against land degradation. This fight is vital to food security in our region, where soil is lost not only to drought and floods caused by extreme climate events, but also to directly human-induced erosion, pollution, and unsustainable agricultural practices. Last year, the UN Food Systems Summit discussed the promotion and restoration of healthy soil as an important way forward to boost nature-based solution for sustainable food production. We need to identify action to follow up on the summit and effectively apply solution for the transformation of food system to make them healthy resilient, equitable, as well as sustainable. Although modern technologies and machinery are crucial to achieving the levels of food productivity needed, they need to be sustainable by ensuring soil pre preservation while elevating the farmer's increased labor needs, as well as reducing the application of agrochemical inputs. Our region has the ingenuity and capacity to develop and implement such innovative solution, and many of our member states, such our host today, Cambodia and China, are increasingly adopting conservation agriculture approaches, which support their pledges to transform food system through the preservation of their soil. Even if some countries in the region have reached high levels of progress on the past, the pandemic has taught us how fragile and interdependent our achievement can be. 
Distinguished delegates, regional cooperation is the only way to develop the common political will needed to undertake the necessary action to achieve the improvement of food system and ultimately of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The theme of this year's APFSD is indeed very fitting, which is building back better from COVID-19 while advancing full implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The efforts to recover from the pandemic need to boost our action to achieve SDGs with new partnership. And in this perspective, the Global Development Initiative recently launched by China can play a role in speeding up the implementation of the 2030 Agenda by also prioritizing food security. This is in line with the vision laid out in the Secretary General report, our common agenda for the future of global cooperation and reinvigorating multilateralism. As CAP, through the work of its Beijing-based CSAM, is supporting food system transformation through the modernization of the agriculture sector by leveraging partnership across the region. For example, in the case of Cambodia, we have supported pilot initiatives for conservation agriculture, sustainable intensification, as well as agroecology. CSAM's regional project ad addressing straw burning and its impact on soil health is also now being expanded to Cambodia, Indonesia, as well as Nepal, yeah, with the support of the China SCAP Cooperation Program. The project was recently cited among uh, the good practices of South-South Cooperation, South-South and Triangle Cooperation by the UN Office for South-South Cooperation. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, our greatest resource is our region's capacity for innovation. We will need to learn from each other's successes and best practices to build back better food system, halt and reverse land degradation and improve our food security. I'm confident that your discussion today will bring about this new opportunities partnership to scale up these efforts and advance the full implementation of the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Aminda, for your very warm uh, welcome um, uh, opening remarks. Thank you so much. And now I would like to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Wok uh, Sopon, Ambassador uh, Extraordinary and Planning Potentiary of Cambodia to Thailand and the Permanent Representative of Cambodia to ASCAP. Thank you so much, Excellency, Ms. Amida, and Ms. Amanda, UN Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the UN. Excellency, Mr. Wang Han, Ambassador of China to China. Mr. Yu Sheng He, Permanent Representative of China to the UN. Excellency, Panelists, ladies and gentlemen. To give so good afternoon to you all. I'm delighted and honored to be with you in open opening session and co-host today Evelyn on the promoting food security through combating soil inflation in Asia Pacific. Taking this opportunity, I would like to thank my co-host. Permanent Mission of the People's Republic of China to the NESCA and, and the UN ESCAP Center for Sustainable Agricultural Nationalization for making this fire-even happen. It is, it is very interesting topic and we are continuing to promote food security, their practical application and practices are needed to affect to our degradation. And marginalization by solution will be at hand in the target of the uh, SDG 15. Actually, good soil are necessary for agricultural productivity as well as for the human health, biodiversity, gas and water quality, and climate, uh, climate relation. However, around the world, and sustainable land use. And farming, uh, farming practices are leading to rapid erosion 
and so on degradation and perilling food security. Commitment of the Rohingya government of Cambodia to sustainable agriculture development has been, uh, has been reflected in each overarching rectangular strategy for and national strategy development plan 2019-2023, as well as a number of agriculture policy and plan of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and history of Cambodia. And Cambodia commitment to work the target set in the Cambodia Sustainable Development Goal, the United Nations Convention on Combating Reverse Education, the United Nations Convention on the Biological Diversity, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to achieve its goal in May 2020. Cambodia has stepped up to establish the Cambodia Conservation, Agriculture and Sustainable Intensification Consortium, the national mechanism for collaboration and coordination with a network of organizations are implementing activities related to conservation agriculture in Cambodia. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like also to share my first personal use, turning food security and soil degradation as follows. Firstly, this event should take into account both human and natural implications on our existing farming climate change even the COVID-19 pandemic, as mentioned by Madame uh, the, uh, Secretary of State of the UNESCO about the COVID-19. Is an uh, added factor causing more people hard to accept the food. Secondly, more effort and priority should be concentrated on building partnership between public and private sector, as well as all stakeholders, with the goal to enable more people to support, contribute, and implementing existing work plan and arrangement on the food security and the soil degradation. Thirdly, there is a need as well to ensure that modern technologies and farming, farming practices are sustainable and contribute to preventing and alleviating soil degradation. Uh, I believe that this event would also provide opportunity for all speakers, panelists, all participants to exchange views, share thoughts, and make recommendations regarding soil degradation and food security in the region. The region that I mean, we are in the Mekong family, we are in the ASEAN family, and Asia Pacific. I wish this forum a great success with the fruitful discussion, suggestion, and recommendation made during the event. Thank you so so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Excel uh, Excellency, uh, for sharing your visions and opening remarks. Uh, it's now my honor to introduce His Excellency, Mr. Han Zhiqiang, Ambassador Extraordinary and Planning Potentiary of China to Thailand. Her Excellency, Ibu Ms. Amida Alice Japana, Executive Secretary of uh, SCAP. His Excellency Mr. O Sopan, Ambassador of Cambodia to Thailand. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the side event themed promoting food security through combating soil degradation in the Asia-Pacific. This side event is co-organized by the Permanent Mission of China and the Permanent Mission of Cambodia to ASCAP. Together with the Center for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization, 
aiming at promoting the implementation of 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. As ancient Chinese saying goes, when granaries are full, the society will be stable. As food decides national prosperity and the people's well-being, China attaches great importance to the agricultural development and uh, <clears throat> takes food security as the top priority in state governance. Since the beginning of 21st century, the number one policy document issued by the central government every year has been on agricultural development for 19 executive years. With continuous efforts, the agricultural development of China has achieved positive progress and paved the road for food security with Chinese characteristics. In 2021, China's total green production raised to 683 billion kilograms, keeping its record of yearly production above 650 billion kilogram for seven executive years. Self-sufficiency rate of wheat and rice has reached 100%, and that of corn has reached over 95%. The production of fruit, vegetables, tea, meat, eggs, and the fish stays first around the world. China manages to feed 20% of global population with merely 9% of global arable land and 6% of global fresh water resources. The policies and experience we adopted to ensure absolute security of stable grains are as follows. Firstly, strengthening arable land protection. China carries out national overall plan on land use and takes strict measures to manage non-agricultural activities which occupy arable lands, especially high quality arable land. This aims to guarantee the bottom line of 120 million hectares of arable land. China carries out overall plan on high quality farmland management and the integrated supporting measures, including soil improvement and has developed more than 60 million hectares of high quality farmland. Secondly, establishing science and technology innovation system. China promotes research into improved varieties of greens. The latest round of green upgrading has achieved significant progress. China is actively swifting the pattern of agricultural development, extending the agricultural mechanization of main crop from cultivation to the entire process, including plant protection, straw treatment, and drying. Thirdly, promoting sustainable agriculture. China reinforces the sustainable use and the protection of arable land, water resources, and the biodiversity. Carries out a pilot system of follow rotation 
of arable land. We strengthen the soil pollution control and the restoration and the promotes green agricultural technology. The pesticide and the fertilizer use has been dropping for four, for four consecutive years. Fourthly, deepening international agricultural cooperation. China assists developing countries in agricultural development to increase food security through foreign aid and South-South cooperation. China has dispatched over 2,000 agricultural experts and technical staff to over 70 countries and regions. China has also been providing strong support to CSAM to promoting regional agricultural cooperation and supports SCAP to implement cooperation program through China SCAP cooperation program, including projects that help Cambodia, Nepal, and Indonesia to promote the sustainable and climate smart agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, as we meet, the pandemic is still spreading in the world. Natural disasters are hitting frequently. Food security is under severe threat, hosting great challenges to sustainable development in Asia and in the Pacific. We must deepen agricultural cooperation. We should reinforce biodiversity protection promote sustainable agricultural mechanization and strengthen soil degradation management. Developing countries should be supported to improve capacity, capacity in food production and security. We must uphold multilateralism. We should adhere to the principle for mutual benefit and win-win. Improve the coordination of agricultural policies and build a fair, reasonable, sustainable, and stable global agricultural trade order. Global and regional agricultural governance need to be improved to maintain global food security. We must develop partnership, solidarity, and cooperation should be strengthened to tackle the common challenges like climate change and soil degradation. Close partnership need to be formed to bring government, international organizations, and the private sectors together to promote the implementation of the 2030 Agenda together. Ladies and gentlemen, last September, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed the Global Development Initiative at the general debate of the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. Calling on international community to strengthen global development partnership and accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, aiming at stronger, greener, and healthier global development. This January, the Group of Friends of GDI was launched at the UN New York headquarters. The GDI is an initiative aiming at promoting global development. The GDI adheres to the people-centered philosophy and holds development 
as the master key to all problems. Bearing in mind the most urgent challenges faced by the countries, by all countries, especially developing countries in their development process. The GDI identifies eight priority areas of cooperation, including poverty reduction, food security, climate change, and green development. To this end, it has also put forward cooperation proposals and plans to translate development consensus into pragmatic actions so as to inject new impetus to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The GDI follows the principle of extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefits, and is a platform for mutually beneficial and win-win cooperation. All like-minded countries and stakeholders committed to the Global Development Partnership are welcome to join the initiatives. The going is difficult when doing it alone. The going becomes easier when doing it with many others. China would like to join hands with all parties to tide over the tough times and jointly promote agricultural sustainable development through the GDI to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and build a community with a shared future of mankind. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Ambassador Han, for your very uh, comprehensive and inspiring uh, opening remarks. Uh, so thank you very much, Excellencies Ibu Amida, um, Ambassador Sopon and Ambassador Han for your very valuable insights of the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, at the beginning, uh, at the opening of APFSD, the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed mentioned that in order to achieve the 2030 Agenda, we need to put emphasis on leaving no one behind. For this reason, I'm very pleased now to ask our next speaker, who will share an address as a representative of a civil society organizations. Let me introduce Ms. Esther Polunia, Secretary General, Asian Farmers Association. She's also a member of the Advisory Committee and the Scientific Group for the Food Systems and the Summit held last year, of which our event is a first follow-up action. So, Mr. Uh, Esther, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Yutung Lee. And I want to take, take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this event, the permanent missions of the People's Republic of China and Cambodia to ESCAP, the Center for Sustainable Agriculture Mechanization, for inviting us to this year's side event to Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. Uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation and I would like to ask colleagues from CISAM if they could share the flash the presentation for, for all of us. Okay, thank you. So we can we go to the first slide. So uh, this, this what is a healthy soil? We're talking about soil here, but what is a healthy soil? I know that you will agree with me that this is not a picture of a healthy soil. So a healthy soil is a soil that has so many crops, plants, and trees in it, or even weeds and grasses, so many uh, pests, so many pests and insects. No? A healthy soil is one that has organic mat matters in it, has a large population of beneficial organisms, no chemicals or toxins that may harm the crop and the organisms that are in the soil. And 
a healthy soil, healthy soil will keep cycles of that will keep the nutrients in a cycling fashion. And what makes a healthy soil? It's the decomposition of organic matter is one big uh, area, uh, one big uh, thing not to make the soil healthy. So that in this understanding, I would like to share with you what many of our farmers who are promoting healthy soils are doing. First, next slide, please. And next slide, please. Okay, the first is organic farming. We said that healthy soil should contain so many organic materials in it. And one of the best ways to have uh, to, to approach farming to have healthy soils is organic farming because it uses ecologically based pest controls and biological fertilizers derived largely from animal and plant waste and nitrogen fixing cover crops. In this picture, we have organic coffee and organic rice uh, that are the organic coffee is produced by our members in Indonesia, in Laos, in Cambodia, in the Philippines. And this uh, rice is organic rice is also produced by our members in Philippines, Cambodia, uh, Laos, and in Nepal and India as well. Okay. Compared with conventional agriculture, organic farming uses fewer pesticides, reduces soil erosion, decreases nitrate leaching into groundwater and surface water, and recycles animal waste back into the farm. Uh, I would like to mention here that. In Cambodia, our member Farmer and Nature Net was very successful in, 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 in convincing farmers to adopt the system of rice intensification, which is le very low chemical input rice farming. And this system of rice intensification was adopted by the Cambodian government. Next slide, please. Okay, another, another approach or another practice towards healthy soil is farm diversification. This is the farm of the couple Aming and Dante Pajaron. Aming is in the picture there. Uh, she is from, the, the couple is from Mindanao, Philippines. And after 10 years of hard work, and training activities, the couple can now earn $600 a month. That's good farming income for, for us in the country from their integrated rice, duck, fish, tree, and flower farming. So now her farm is uh, now an eco-tourism site where uh, many young farmers would go to learn about integrated, diversified, and organic farming. But in many, in, in um, our members, for example, also in Indonesia, in, in Cambodia, and in, uh, Bangladesh, uh, they, they use this kind of approach as well. Next. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a close up, a close up of the integrated farm of Aming Paharon. So you could really see there the synergies between the ducks and the rice. Uh, the rice, uh, they, they benefit each other you know, by just being there. Next, next is biomass recycling and rice hulls and re residues. And our farmers uh, uh, create a lot of biochar, a biochar through, for example, heating, heating or burning uh, rice hulls, uh, coconut, coconut husks, or, or potato or soy hay. Okay, next. Next is agroforestry. This is uh, what, what our farmers in forested landscape usually do. This is an integration of perennial trees as well as annual as annual plants, so that you could earn you could earn from the short short term crops as well as for the long term crops. And in the process, you use all the organic materials that are from the trees and from the plants. And next, making of organic fertilizers and composting is also 
one one uh, usual way for our farmers to build or to make healthy soils. And lastly, and lastly, this is our battle cry: okay, farmers for healthy people, planet, healthy soil, and healthy to, uh, leave their, uh, room. and healthy planet. Uh, so. I would like to mention uh, because some of you mentioned the the, the coalition on agroecology. This is one of the coalitions that emerged during during the UNFSS processes. Right now, there are twenty eight countries involved in the coalition on agriculture agroecology. Four are in Asia: Cambodia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka. And we would, and this coalition is aimed to accelerate the transformation of food systems through agroecology, guided by the thirteen principles of agroecology. We hope that members in Asia, member states in Asia Pacific, would join this coalition because this is a partnership coalition of the willing. And there are farmers organizations. There, AFA is included in this coalition. There is private sector. There are research institutions. And the second, the second multi partnership that we see that can really promote soil health is the asset project, agroecology and safe food system transition project implemented by the Agroecological Learning Alliance in Southeast Asia Network, being implemented in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. So we hope that we could also support this uh, coalition. So we call, we, we join the call for SCAP and CISAM and its member states to mainstream sustainable, climate resilient, integrated, diversified agroecological practices in farms, fisheries, and forests with family farmers as equal partners in planning and implementation. So together we can unleash the potentials of millions of small scale family farmers in Asia Pacific to make healthy soils, provide healthy food, and make the planet healthy. Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Dr. Yutong Lee. Thank you very much, uh, dear Esther, for bringing these very important uh, pr perspectives. And we have heard uh, the very clear uh, messages and voices from farmers. Um, uh, I'm now pleased to move on to our panel. Our next speakers will bring some interesting perspectives on the issue of soil preservation on food security and cooperation. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Norat Vargas from FAO, who is the secretary of the Global so Soil Partnership. So Mr. Vargas, uh, what's, what is the importance of soil conservation and how it can be uh, compatible with agriculture needs? Thank you very much, Ms. Moderator. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Good day to the excellencies, farmers, all participants. So I will speak about soil degradation and food security. And of course, it's important to mention that currently we have many challenges that we need to address, including food insecurity, but also linked to that, we need to see climate change, the biodiversity loss, pollution, degradation, water scarcity, etc. And we countries made a commitment towards the sustainable development goals. In here, of course, healthy soils can help a lot. Why? Because a healthy soil is not only able to produce nutritious and safe food. Healthy soils also are fundamental for ensuring that our planet is working because soils deal with the nutrient cycle, carbon sequestration, they provide really the basis for all of our activities. Therefore, a healthy soil is important. But in this context, it is more important because it is where food begins. Because 95% uh, of the food produced by farmers comes from our soils, right? That is the main source of all our food. Therefore, it is very important. And when looking at food security and soils, we need to consider that soils help us, of course, to produce food. Crop yield is very important. And now, more than ever, we want very nutritious food and that this food is safe, so free of contaminants, free of pathogens. 
At the same time, we want to have a very low environmental footprint when producing food because we don't want to emit, for instance, uh, greenhouse gases. We want to maintain diversity and we want to be ready to adapt to any condition, including climate change. Currently, globally, for instance, we have black soils around the world and these black soils are considered the food basket of the world because they, they are very fertile and they produce quite a lot of food. And if we don't manage sustainably these soils, we will lose them. And that's something we should be avoiding. Globally, unfortunately, we know that we have soil degradation as an issue in, the, in its various forms from soil erosion, the loss of organic carbon, nutrient imbalance, pollution, loss of biodiversity, compaction, etc. If we don't take action now, the situation is going to get worse. And the estimations we did is that globally, we have around 33% of, of degraded soils already. So if we don't take action, this will be an issue. And why we allow soil degradation to take place? Sometimes because we don't appreciate the role of soils as a living resource, and we don't know that soil is not renewable in a human time scale because it takes many years for nature to create one centimeter of soils. Soil is a hidden resource. We cannot see it, and that's why we cannot value it. And sometimes we need to get the message low to the general public that it is important to pay attention because the causes of soil degradation are mainly related to unsustainable human practices. And that is something that we need to correct because as our colleague from the Asian Farmer Association showed, there are many good options that are there, but we need to scale them up. Otherwise, we will have very bad consequences as soils, as I show, are very much related to the nutrition. If we, as you can see here, soil, a plant requires many elements. Most of them come from the soil. So if a soil is depleted, then it will have very bad consequences in the crop and then directly in the human because the human will be eating something that will be not nutritious as we expect. Therefore, that is very much related. And there are, for instance, this hidden malnutrition where we are missing very important microelements. At the same time, if we don't manage soils well, soil degradation has a negative impact because we will be start emitting greenhouse gases and then contributing negatively to climate change. If we don't control the contaminants, Unfortunately, soil pollution is a real issue because although we don't see it, but we are eating crops and also uh, animal um, products that bring contaminants into our bodies. Therefore, we really need to pay attention because otherwise our, our health is compromised. When we are overusing fertilizers, for instance, or nutrients, then we are having a negative effect on our water bodies. And that's something that we need to be careful about. What are the opportunities? Basically, when talking about environmental health, animal health, and human health, we should also include soil health because that is inherent to all of these three sectors. But not all is negative. We have very good chances to revert the situation because there are potentialities. Soils can help us to ensure food security, food safety, soil biodiversity can help us to have biological control. They can also act as the remediation in terms of uh, pollution, the climate change adaptation and mitigation. We have very clear examples on how we can use soil biodiversity in order, for instance, to enhance productivity, to reduce the use of agrochemicals. We do have a very important role to play in agriculture in order to, to ensure that we don't lose the carbon that it's already in our soils. And there is a huge potential to sequester more. The answer to all of this 
is sustainable soil management. If we are able to adopt particularly farmers and we need to support them because sometimes they are just left alone, they need, they can adopt sustainable soil management practices in order to prevent degradation and is degraded to revert the situation. So we have different ways to do that. And one of them is Soul Doctors, which is a very nice program in Thailand that we are now scaling up at global level. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. And my message is basically, we can repair the situation of soil degradation, but we need strong commitment because there are good examples, good practices, but it is time to scale them up. And for this, we need real commitments, particularly from policy, from investment. And of course, we need to keep farmers in the center. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vargas. Uh, uh, and uh, I think you're framing this issue very clearly. Uh, thank you so much. And also for joining us at such an inconvenient hour uh, for your time zone. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Wen uh, Mingqing Wen. He is a member of the China Economic and Social Council and also director of the Resources, uh, e Ecology and Bioresources Research Division and the vice director of the Center for Natural and Cultural Car Heritage of the Institute of Geographic Sciences and the Natural Resources at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, CAS. So, Mr. Ming, uh, our distinguished speakers in their opening remarks mentioned the importance of regional and international cooperation, including through the Global Development Initiatives, GDI. Can you please share how GDI's food security objective can bring opportunities for soil conservation? Okay, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lee. And it's my pleasure to have uh, the chance to give my comments and uh, my experiences about uh, the food security opportunities in the Global Development uh, Initiative. I, I will try to give the introduction about it. Uh, as you know, uh, the last year, President uh, Xi Jinping proposed the Global Development Initiative, and uh, we know the end GDI how to maintain the harmony between man and nature to ensure food security and to promote green development are uh, all the important contents. And we know the maintenance of the soil ecosystem services is related to the food security and green agriculture development, which need us to active, actively explore soil conservation strategies, promote soil facility recovery, its effectively control soil pollution and improve soil ecological functions. And it's very interesting, during the last 20 years, I have been working in the field of uh, the traditional agriculture and uh, their contribution to the modern ecological agriculture. And traditional agriculture, we call it the agricultural heritage. So I want to give you some examples of China's agricultural heritage. And uh, maybe they should provide provide us with the valuable ideas and practical experiences to the soils, sustainability, and ensure food security. And this is, sorry, this is the first one is about the Qingtian rice fish culture system. And it's the very typical model of ecological symbiosis. The system itself maintains good mutualism relationship through fish eating insects and weeds, fish pulp fertility and do not need to use chemical fertilizers to ensure the safety and the ecological balance of soil. And in addition, due to the breathing, uh, foraging, and the excretion of the fish, the related microbiome naturally forms. So, we're treating the spread of other microorganisms, effectively elevating various diseases, reduce the use of uh, pesticides and insecticides, and improve the environment. So, and just for this reason, this system was certificated by uh, Food and Agriculture Organization as the GIS site in 2005. The GIS means the globally important agricultural heritage systems or the world agricultural heritage. These are the first uh, the examples. The second one is uh, the Huzhou, Marbury, Dyke, and Fish Pond system. 
and it's uh, not uh, the traditional ecological uh, agriculture practice in China. It is a very typical model of material circulation. The system itself maintains the material circulation through the mulberry leaf feeding sick worms, excrementum, bombyces, manuals pond, fish farming, fish pond sludge fertilizing mulberry with zero emission. So it could ensure the safety and the ecological balance of the water body. Just for this reason, the system was certificated by FAO as a genocide in 2017. And the third one is uh, the Ohan dry land farming system. Uh, maybe uh, you know in China, it's a very typical model of the intensive and meticulous farming, including the intergrouping, uh, multiple grouping in the planting, rotation, continuous grouping, falling, and so on. So all, all general practice, the effective utilization of soil facility resources can be realized by combined land consuming groups with land improved groups, which solve the problems of uneven soil nutrients and the thinning of the tillage layer, and realize the benign cycle of soil nutrients and a certain yield increase. And this city was certificated by FAO as a GIS site in 2012. And uh, I want to show you the last one is uh, uh, the model for the Hunghe Honey Rice Territory City. It's a very typical model of optimizing landscape structure. It's a great creation to adapt to steep slope farming. Forests, villages, and terraced fields are arranged from the top to bottom, and spring water stream in the road and down into the village terraces and as the large rivers converge into the river. So the four-in-one pattern in special structure to enhance the function of the soil and water, ensuring the system stability of the villager and the safe purification ability. And it's very interesting, the system was certificated by FAO as GIS site in 2010. And three years later, it was designated by UNESCO as a World Cultural Heritage Site. And so from these cases, we can find the traditional knowledge and techniques in the agricultural heritage play an important role in maintaining soil health, which help to enhance the soil fertility and with contracting the soil fertilizer relationship and to control soil pollution and ensure environmental security and to recover the damaged soil and improve the ecological function. So I think learning from agricultural heritage maybe could provide them some ideas for soil health and food security. In other words, maybe learn from the past, it helped to our common future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ming. Uh, uh, your presentation has given us a wider perspective on our topic, together with the presentation made by Mr. Vargas of FAO. Uh, we will now move to some of the actions taking place at the country level with our next group of panelists. First, I'm very pleased to introduce a longtime partner of CSAM, Dr. Sarves Chan, uh, Under Secretary of State, for the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries of Cambodia, uh, who will share the actions taken by Cambodia for multi-stakeholder engagement for conservation agriculture. The floor is yours, Dr. Sasu Chan. Dr. South Chen, please unmute yourself. Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, you have mute yourself.
Yes. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Lee. Can you hear me? So, uh, sorry for the, uh, the hour, the, uh, uh, a little bit uh, mistake of the technical problem. So, again, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for giving uh, me a chance to join this uh, important event and thank you the uh, co organizer uh, of this event too. So, uh, it is a, a good opportunity for me to join. Uh, this event and under the uh, term of the uh, multi stakeholder engagement for the conservation of culture. As you may aware that the uh, land migration uh, and water scarcity, uh, scarcity are the real challenge uh, of the uh, global food security and is of the particular relevant to Cambodia. The main issue concerning the land degrees, uh, degradation in Cambodia, a conversion of forest to non-forest climate change effect, pests and diseases, unsustainable land management practices, soil erosion, and infrastructure development. The UNCCC, the UNCCD National Action Program, NAP, which has recently been approved by the cabinet of the Minister of the Royal Government of Cambodia, in 2018, I set the foundation for the potential commitment from the government toward achieving land degradation neutrality by 2030. The NEP has set the goal toward achieving the poverty alleviation and maintaining sustainable agricultural development through effective use of management and land of land and forest resources to improve mitigation and adaptation capacity to climate change. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce about the conservation agriculture in Cambodia. As you may, hear that, uh, uh, as you may uh, know that the conservation agriculture is a farming system that can prevent losses of arable land while uh, generating degradation land, it has three principles, consists of one, the cover crop, two, uh, low tillage, three, crop rotation. Um, according to the experience in Cambodia, uh, we start to work with the uh, uh, the uh, different uh, development, uh, the uh, uh, partner, the multi stakeholder partner, they come from the government, from the uh, private sector, and from the uh, development partner. So uh, it is uh, the initiate from the uh, multi stakeholder to form as the conservation, agriculture, and sustainable agriculture. The uh, Authentication Consortium and Ministry of Culture is the uh, leading the uh, organization with the relevant partner from the land ministry, the head of Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of the uh, Water Resources, and Ministry of Women Affairs. As well as we also have the Cambodia Chamber of Commerce. As the represent of the uh, farming, the, uh, the uh, of the private sector also engage in this uh, our the management level. So we uh, just would like to inform that uh, it is a uh, weak form as the uh, bottom up approach. We are not the the, uh, the one who uh, provide any resources to the, our implementing agency. But we encourage all the, our existing implement agency to work together under one umbrella. So the from the uh, public side that we provide and facilitate 
all of our the uh, partner from the private from the uh, development uh, partner and also the farmer the uh, organization to come and work and according to what we set up this the consortium we can observe that uh, before we start to implementing or uh, introducing the conservation agriculture for more than 10 years, but we could not have any chance to scale up. While we form the consortium, we call it casting, we can see the, the, the land they cover it by the conservation agriculture increase uh, triple with uh, in the uh, in the last two years so it is uh, uh, amazing and so also the it's good lesson learned that we we have the different uh, the partner especially with the demand from the demand side to the supply side to have a chance to meet together and under the facilitation and coordination of the asset and it is what we could say that uh, it is a good example that we uh, we uh, we start from the what we have at the existing activity at the ground and we start to support them and facilitate them step by step and finally they could provide and support to each other and we can also reduce the some the gap that are missing with, uh, from one the uh, partner to another partner. So, uh, because of the time, I would like to thank to the co-organizer and also thank again to the Dr. Lee for good the facilitating and thank you to all. Thank you very thank much. You uh, very much. Um, and the CSAM uh, look forward to continue collaboration with you on the ACASIC mm -hmm. and other initiatives uh, with your side. Uh, I'm now pleased to introduce our next distinguished speaker who will introduce the actions on black soil conservation machinery and equipment in China. So Professor Luo Xiwen, academician, Chinese Academy of Engineering and uh, Professor of South China Agriculture University. So Professor Luo, floor is yours. Okay. So, Professor Law, do you yeah. need the outside to share the uh, PPT or you can share from your uh, side? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, moderate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steven Law from South China Agriculture University, People's Republic of China. Thanks very much for CASM's invitation. The topic of my speech is Black Soil Conservation Machinery and Equipment in China. This is the outline of my speech. There are four big black land in the world. One is the northeast of China, which produces 25% of China's grain, but it has been gradually degraded. Therefore, Chinese government has proposed the black soil protection and the black soil conservation TDJ plans, including a variety of technologies to protect the black land. One of the key technologies for conservation TDJ is the position of crop straw. For crop straw, we can use this straw chart. The straw is chopped and then thrown to the soil surface. The chopped straw is beneficial for the foreign tillage and the soil 
operation. In the case of a large amount of straw, we can use this strip tier to form strip TDJ surface, then store seeds on the TDJ strips. We can also use disk horror and chest plow to mix chopped straw with soil to reduce the cover rate of straw on the soil surface surface. It's a beneficial for the soaring operation. As we know, the soil would form a hot plow base of the long-term plowing. It makes the soil never thinner, which is adverse for crop growth, and then reduce soil storage capacity. So to deal with this situation, different type of subsoil can be used to break hot plow base. Vibrating subsoil can also be used to improve the effect of soil notion. This is a shear rotary cultivate. With the higher speed rotary path, the straw is mixed with the soil, which create soft top soil with the nice straw. If the ground is covered with the straw, a low TDJ seed is required. According to the straw block method, low TDJ seeds can be divided into two types. When is a low TDJ seed with the disc open, all the parts in contact with the soil are rotating. Hence, there would be no straw broken problem and a small amount of soil disturbance. Here are some low-tier cedars with the disc open, which are widely used in China. In the field with a large amount of straw and without reduced tillage, this strip tillage cedar can be used to strip tillage and the soil can be finished by one machinery. Slow many years conservation tillage, the degradation of black land in northeast of China has been controlled. We will do our best to combat soil degradation and promote food security. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Law. Uh, and the CSAM really looks forward to support all these uh, efforts you introduced, in particular in order to disseminate and scale up uh, these rich experiences and the good practices. Uh, thank you, Professor Law, indeed. Uh, we have looked at some machinery solutions, and indeed we are moving from more traditional practices to more modern technologies. Our next speaker will continue on this trend, introducing principles of precision agriculture and its applications of using agrochemicals more efficiently, protecting soil health. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Siti Noor Ali uh, Binti Baharom from the Engineering oh. Research Center, Malaysia uh, Agricultural Research oh. and Development Institute, Mardi. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Oh. Siti. Can you hear me, Siti? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear oh. you very clearly. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Ms. Lee, and also thank you to this escape system for giving me opportunities to share how precision agriculture could contribute to efficient use of agrochemicals and improve soil health based on our experience in Malaysia, specifically uh, by Malaysian Agriculture Research and Development Institute, MARDI. So a recent study on sustainable practices among paddy farmers at northern region of Malaysia, where the paddy granary area allocated, reported that 80% of farmers practice unsustainable farming, including exceeding recommended amount of agrochemical application and not following application schedule. The unsustainable practice is influenced by pressure to raise yield targets and profitability, and whilst in order in back to the environment, particularly to the soil. The application of agrochemicals in the soil in the form of fertilizer, pesticide, and radicide is a way to achieve the target to a certain stage. However, the decrease in crop yield took place despite the application of these agrochemicals. This means excessive application does not guarantee consistently growing yields. If used in excessive and disappropriate amounts, they negatively affect the soil health that causes fertility, depletion, soil crust and acidification, loss of soil nutrients, obstructing the breakdown of soil organic matter, and altering nutrient cycle. Contaminated soil with agrochemicals can also decrease soil aggregate stability, affect soil microorganisms and enzyme activities, which leads to loss of beneficial microbes increases soil erosion and mobility of nutrients, boosting pest growing, which leads to stunting plant growth and low yield production. Precision agriculture offers an effective and efficient approach to ensure accurate application of agrochemicals that are within the recommended safety limits and indirectly prevent soil degradation and freeze of soil health. These are amounts of the systems that comprise in the precision agriculture technology. Uh, for lab preparation, an auto leveler system is used to detect uneven surface at specific locations. The system cuts the soil at high level spot and fill them at low level spot. By using this system, we can construct an even soil surface, establish a uniform level land that also able to prevent water logging. A flat and uniformly level land will ensure not only crop establishment, but also provide adequate protection from competing with growth. And this could minimize redesign usage and has potentially reduced soil contamination due to SSC redesign application. The next system that we have as part of the precision agriculture technologies is the soil sensor system. The soil sensor system is a tool to aid quantification or estimation of soil nutrient content at specific locations. The system that works in tandem with GNSS eliminates the need of tedious manual soil sampling, as well as intensive and time-consuming lab soil laboratory analysis. The high-density information on the soil nutrient availability obtained by using the sensor system are used to determine fertilizer rates at specific location for variable rate fertilizer application. By knowing the level of soil nutrients such as nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium, the fertilizer can be applied at minimum quantities required and at very specific target areas. As a result of the application of fertilizer allocation where the nutrients availability are sufficient can be avoided. In order to apply the fertilizer at variable rate, another system that we have as part of the precision agriculture technology is the variable rate fertilizer application system. The system applies fertilizer at variable rate based on the information of soil nutrient availability and crop nutrient status at specific location. These techniques allow accurate fertilizer rate application that can replace the uniform banked fertilizer method. With this technology, the fertilizer can be used efficiently where low or over fertilizer application can be avoided and hence minimize soil contamination due to excessive fertilizer application. Another system in the precision agriculture technology that contributes to the efficient use of agrochemical is the early warning system for monitoring pest attack. This system is used to replace conventional pest control practice where pesticide is applied with the information on the pest population occurrence at specific time. It monitors pest population and provides decision support for pest control based on severity level of pest attack at specific location and time. This information is required to guide the use of pesticide and prevent from unnecessary application. 
This efficient pest control in turn minimizes the negative effect of pesticide on soil health in the long, long run. So we come to the main outcome and benefits of precision agriculture. Based on the trial implementation of precision agriculture technologies at two Malaysian rice canneries in four cultivation season, the use of chemical fertilizer reduced by 12% to 17% per hectare through the variable application method compared to the conventional blanket fertilizer application. Precision agriculture technology utilizes the 3R concept, which is the right amount, right location, and right time, contributes to efficient use of agrochemicals, and thus minimizing environmental pollution and soil degradation. Uh, challenge in precision agriculture uh, has been slowly taken by the farmers, not only because of the high cost that requires substantial capital, uh, farmers also reluctant to change or adapt to a new technologies. Farmers like the idea of variable rate technology, but not so convinced of its value. So for the recommendation, national policies can aid reducing or spreading burden of high cost. Land consolidation through regional farmers association could ease the adoption of precision agriculture on large scale farm area. Government policies that will promote the use of precision for agriculture technologies in the future should be formed. Incentive is one form of financial assistance that the government can provide to promote the adoption of precision technology. Intensive technology transfer program by extension agencies need to be carried out. Farmers can to implement the technology as long as the technology benefit outweigh the cost. With that, I, that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Siti. Uh, it is very useful and uh, crucial for the uh, health of soil uh, with your visions and introduction. Uh, and now move on to our last but not least speaker. One of the five priorities, uh, priorities listed by Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed when opening the APFSD uh, is to facilitate women's economic inclusion. This is also true when addressing food security and um, Therefore, please to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mrs. Magna Apriti, Agriculture Engineer at the Agriculture Machinery Center, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry, Bhutan, who will share some gender considerations for sustainable and soil friendly mechanization in mountain ecosystems. The floor is yours, Mrs. Magna. Uh, can you see my slide? Uh, I can hear a voice, but I cannot see your slide. Do you need an uh, uh, outside to share your slide? Okay, sure. So, okay. Uh, I will try once again. Like, Are you able to see my slide now? Yes, yes. So you can see my slide? Yes. Okay. So, yes, please go ahead. Uh, a very warm good afternoon to you all. So it's my pleasure to represent Agriculture Machinery Center, which is one of the main farm mechanization body in Bhutan. So uh, I'm honored to present to this forum today. So in Bhutan, 66% uh, of population is involved in agriculture in which more than 50% are women and they practice subsistence agriculture in Bhutan. So an interesting fact, almost 70% of the land is owned by women mainly because of the matrilineal inheritance and coming to the migration and remittance, uh, according to the census, 48.7% of the population have migrated to urban city in search of uh, jobs. So 
This has led to labor shortage in rural areas impacting women who are less likely to migrate. So this translates to a very high drudgery and work burden to women because they are not only involved in rural activities, but also they shoulder a disproportionate amount of work burden in uh, uh, household activity and com uh, community activities. Uh, talking about the topography and geographical feature of the country, Bhutan is a very small country landlocked uh, and sandwiched between India and China. And the geographical size of the country is just 38,394 kilometers squared, of which only 2.93% of the area is cultivated land. And this limited cultivated land is due to undulating topography and steep topography. So about 70% of our agricultural land is located on steep slope of which 31% lies on slope greater than 50%. So this makes the difficulty in using of large machinery and because of that we have small land holding among the among the marginal farmers and by default we have uh, the country have promoted a lot of small machineries which are by default gender friendly. So the vulnerability to annual soil loss in the country is about 29 ton per hectare due to land erosion, landslide and erosion. So restoring soil fertility, improving water ability, domestic uh, production and all will increase the natural resources and enhance food security. And then labor saving technologies and related service can contribute to free up women's time and then improve their life quality and involve uh, themselves in household and other activities which are remunerative in nature. So farming in a mountainous ecosystem is challenged by low soil fertility coupled with cold stress, frequent weather swings and soil erosion. So some of the policies and strategies to promote sustainable land management and promote mechanization, especially for women are as follows. So in terms of land development and sustainable land management practices, a government agency like Central Machinery Unit, National Soil Service Centers are reviving the fallow land and developing lands. And also they have partnership partnership with multilateral donors like World Bank, Global Environment Facilities and Bhutan Trust Fund to promote sustainable land management practices such as terracing, which are usually used for wetland cultivation, check dams in place of gully formation. So gully is considered as one of the main land degradation. Then use of counter stone burns, which will help in retention of water and workability. Then terrace hedge growers and bamboo and tree plantation. So under this intervention, fallow lands were brought under cultivation and about 7,000 acres were bought under SLM practices, and it is expected to increase by 12,000 acres by 2030. So the evidence and the research have shown that these practices have significantly reduced the soil erosion, ease workability in steep terrain, increased the fodder ability to hedge, grow plantation, and stabilize the land, and also added to the monetary income of the farmers. So one of the barriers for women farmers to pur uh, purchase farm machinery is limited finance. So to come back that uh, the nationwide mechanization drive have been carried out and to ensure the machineries, uh, machinery service is availed by women farmers, state-owned subsidized farm machinery hiring service is provided. If this uh, state-owned enterprise cannot reach to the uh, far flung the area, then it is uh, allocated to the local government bodies. And some of the soil friendly machines are powerteller and mini tiller. They have replaced the bullock drawn uh, plow. And uh, this mini tiller is used for land development and it can work up to a slope of nine degree. However, power tiller is little larger and it can normally work at a slope of uh, nine degree, but with our new uh, research and uh, research, we have introduced an extension device which will uh, help us to operate the power tiller at a slope greater than uh, at a slope greater than nine degree and at slope of uh, eighteen point five degrees. And um, 
uh, direct seeding technology and transplanting technology for paddy cultivations are promoted to ensure line plantation and reduce uh, transplanting surgery. And in terms of vegetable cultivation, we have bed making machines on the promotion phase. And weeding is considered one of the very tedious and women centric uh, agriculture operations. So, to come back, that we have uh, uh, introduction of power weeders and uh, mulching technology for dry land cultivation and vegetable cultivation, and then corn weeders for wetland cultivation. Still, then, weeding has uh, been one of the very challenging issues uh, for mechanization in country at present. So research and development, gender-friendly technology and climate resilient technology are still uh, carried out and it needs mainstream and upscaling at present. And to ensure efficient use of water, technologies like water harvesting, hydroponics and micro irrigation is been promoted. And uh, with digitalization gaining its pop popularity, IoT based technologies are incorporated in agriculture system like hydroponics, micro irrigation, greenhouse to, to for a precise farming technology in the country. And also to ensure safe and efficient use of machine, uh, country-based standards are formed and the machines are tested. And also trainings are given to the women farmers at, uh, and they are also given with in, in, incentives and free accommodation. And sometimes these uh, women farmers are not able to make out for, uh, make and uh, come for the and training activities at the offices. So to uh, for to promote the active participation, awareness and hands-on trainings are given at the sites also. And uh, the country is also collaborating with multilateral donors for promotion of such uh, mechanization and SLM, SLM practices. And low interest credit is given to purchase agriculture machinery in the country and zero tax is implied on farm machinery in Bhutan. So uh, in a nutshell, this undulating topography, limited financial support, shortage of farm labor, small land holding and human life, wildlife conflict is the main issues that mountain ecosystem, mountain ecosystem like Bhutan is facing in agriculture. So there is this need to further build the capacity of uh, the women farmers and other farmers. And for that, we need to further explore funds from external do donors to scale up uh, uh, SLM practices, agriculture uh, mechanization in the country through research and development and sensitization program. And also to our scale to a larger agent, we need to main, main, mainstream the private sector participation and focus on this. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. City, uh, which uh, very helpful uh, your presentation on the gender based uh, solutions and uh, policy recommendations. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, we still have uh, two uh, or three minutes, so maybe we can select one or two questions raised in the uh, chat box. Um, one of the question is how do we uh, 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 commercialize uh, uh, CA land preparation for smallholder farmers? Hopefully, uh, our panelists could uh, respond to this question within three minutes. Thank you. So maybe uh, Dr. Thames Chan, uh, you are very, uh, very uh, knowledgeable about these uh, questions about conservation agriculture. Uh, maybe you can respond to these questions uh, in three minutes. Thank you. Dr. Satchan, you mute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Yes, yes. Dr. Uh, Lee, thank you for your uh, good question. Uh, you know, uh, conservation agriculture is uh, uh, very important for the uh, uh, agricultural uh, land improvement. <laughs> at the present and, and also as well as the future. 
However, we uh, need to uh, follow uh, what kind of the uh, machinery is appropriate. So uh, most of the uh, country like Cambodia, we could say that uh, we have the small and the medium farmer who have the, uh, around less than two hectares of land. The more popular, the more popular the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, seeder. We normally we use the four row the uh, seeder with the, uh, the uh, tractor. The capacity uh, around uh, sixty to eighty hours. hour. And but in some area that most of the farmer are using the uh, power tiller. So the uh, we also. Have the uh, design the small the uh, seeder with the two row that apply in by the farmer in uh, uh, some area that uh, they they uh, they could use it for the conservation agriculture in on their farm. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Sams Chan. So I can see Professor Law, you raise your hand. Uh, do you have any uh, co additional comments? Uh, uh, yes, I can hear you. I can hear. Uh, no more. Oh no. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see. Uh, yeah, there's another questions uh, in the chat box that can ask up form a uh, regional policy uh, for adoption crop straw management and uh, CA based mechanization. Uh, yes, we do. Um, CSAM and the ASCAP sub regional office for South South and the Southwest uh, Asia and developing reach, uh, national studies uh, on integrated management of straw residue in collaboration with national experts um, for four countries, namely Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Pakistan. This work already involves development of a sub regional cooperation framework for South Asia for integrated management of straw residue. So for more questions, uh, maybe we can uh, feedback individually after the event. Um, so now we are on time. Um, I thank you again, all, all our speakers. Uh, we have seen their a uh, wider range of key solutions to achieve food security uh, while protecting soil health. So no soil health, no sustainable food security. And we have also learned about opportunities for participants, partnerships and upscaling these solutions. And indeed, CSAM has already engaged with some of our speakers and partners in this direction. So in particular, we look uh, at solutions for smallholder farmers, women farmers and other vulnerable groups and work for promotion and adoption for sustainable agricultural machinery and new technologies, as well as means to discontinue unsustainable practices with lead to land degradation. So we also want to learn uh, from smallholders, uh, grassroots farmers and add their needs since they are closely attached to their land, know their system and have a very valuable knowledge from being on the front line of struggle, the resilience. So this is also key for transformation of our food systems through international cooperation and in particular through South South and Triangular Cooperation. It's in, indeed a very engaging discussion uh, because of time constraints. I now hand over uh, to Mr. Ker Yusheng, permanent, permanent representative of uh, China to ASCAP for his closing remarks. Mr. Ker, please. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, during the past one and a half hours, representatives from member states and international organizations share the best practices and valuable insights from global, regional and national perspectives, which I believe that we added to regional dialogue and be translated into strong impetus to sustainable transition of agriculture and a common state uh, event uh, development. Uh, you know, food security is an important pillar for national security and is a fundamental guarantee for people's well-being. Facing tough challenges, countries in Asia and the Pacific should commit to solidarity and cooperation for response in this area. To this end, China proposed a global development initiative with food security as one of the priority areas. 
and China is willing to strengthen development partnership with all countries so as to promote sustainable agriculture development, improve food security, and promote implementation of the 2030 Agenda in joint efforts uh, with shared prosperity. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all distinguished participants in this event. I also would like to uh, express my sincere appreciation to the permanent mission of Cambodia to ESCAP and to CISA, particularly to Dr. Lee and your team for co-organizing this event and for all your uh, sincere cooperation and joint efforts in making this event uh, uh, a successful one. Again, thank you for your attendance. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ke, and uh, thanks again for uh, our speakers. Uh, this concludes our event, and thank you all participants for your interest and for staying with us until this point. I also invite all participants to complete the event feedback form using the link which has been circulated in the chat. Uh, I now declare uh, this slide event closed. I look forward to collaborating with all of you in the future and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.